Welcome everyone. I'm Keith Christensen, an APSI member. I'm proud to introduce Paul Danchik, Director of Executive Education for USC's Sol Price Sacramento campus, as well as APSI's collaborative partner in Navigating Leadership 2012 and 2013. With our focus on leadership, I thought it would be great for Paul to share the leadership educational opportunities available through USC. Everyone, let's welcome Paul Danchik. We have a Master of Public Administration program that's taught on intensive format um, in this building. Um, the intensive format is going to find in the weekends, Thursday through Sunday, so it's really geared towards working professionals that are out in the field. Um, so if you're interested in an MPA or if you know someone that might be interested, there's a lot of flyers in the hallway on the table that you ran into on the way down. And there's an information session on Thursday um, here at noon. Um, there's a free lunch. We're good at giving them free lunches. Uh, so if you know someone that's interested in lunch, uh, send them our way. Uh, the second two focuses are um, with policy outreach and research. Um, so those are really one thing of uh, connecting Los Angeles faculty with the Sacramento policymaking community. And the final thing is what I focus on, and that's executive programs. I focus on leadership programs in the public and nonprofit sectors and working with some of you in different capacities. Um, so it's good to see so many familiar faces here today. Um, in addition to our day job, um, we spend a lot of time making connections um, with associations, and certainly we're proud to be part of APSI in a very formal capacity. With that, my job is to introduce Becca, who's going to introduce Howard, so it's two <laughs> <laughs> You all know Becca and love Becca for her work. Um, I'm really uh, excited to have met her two years ago now, mm -hmm. if that has can believe that, um, of the way that she thinks about um, systems and thinking about the way that we operate within those systems from a very holistic approach and our role within that larger, cumbersome system um, that we call life. So right. with that, Becca. Thanks so much, Paul. Hi, everyone, and welcome. It's really wonderful to be standing here tonight at our inaugural kickoff of 2013 Navigating Leadership Series, Conversations in Leadership. It's really a pleasure to introduce Howard tonight. Howard Schwartz has been a member of the California Bar Association since 1982. His first job was with the California Public Employment Relations Board. In 1984, Mr. Schwartz spent one year in private practice before accepting a job with the California State Employees Association, where he worked until 1999. In 1999, Schwartz was appointed to, by Governor Gray Davis as the Chief Counsel for the California Department of Personnel Administration. He held that position until November of 2003. From 2003 until January 2011, he served as the Senior Staff Counsel for CalPERS. Mr. Schwartz received his BA in History with honors from UC Davis. He then attended the University of Oregon School of Law, where he received his JD. On November 8, 2012, Howard received the prestigious Individual Award of Leadership Excellence by APSI. In February 2011, Governor Brown appointed Howard Chief Deputy Director for the California Department of Human Resources. Where in the context of all of our meetings, there's a common question that comes forward, and that is that what's a leader? It doesn't pertain to everyone, it's everyone's thinking. I really value the way that Howard sees the capacity of leadership in all of us. He feels that each of us has what it takes to be an effective leader from where we stand. What I really appreciate about what he has to give and share with you tonight is that his approach works for those of us living in and serving a virtual society. I'd like everyone to join me in a warm welcome for Howard Schwartz. If you bear with me, I'd like to do a couple of acknowledgments before I get into the kind of the heart of the presentation. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge everybody that's here. Uh, it's a Tuesday night, and there's hockey games on television. <laughs> um, there are things to go uh, and do and see. Your presence here um, means a great deal uh, and says a great deal to me about your interest in leadership, your interest in improving your own careers, your interest in improving service that's provided to the state, 
um, you know, interested in contributing to the community that we all live in and making uh, our contribution that much more meaningful and that much more productive. So I want to acknowledge everybody first uh, and foremost for coming tonight and joining this conversation. And I want to emphasize that I'd like it to be a conversation. I think it would probably be less useful if I talked at, at you all all evening. Um, I want to give you some of my thoughts, but I also want at any time for you to ask questions or give me some response. Give me your own perspective, your own comments about leadership. This isn't something that I have a monopoly on. Um, there are a lot of great leaders in this room, and I'd like to hear from you what your thoughts are about leadership, and I think that would help us all. Uh, let me acknowledge a couple of other folks, uh, Becca in particular, who's been a great friend of mine over the past year or so, inviting me to come to these uh, events and uh, speak and give my perspective. Uh, that's kind of the benefit of getting old and gray, is that people think that you actually might have something to say. Becca, <laughs> so an it. old gray-haired woman asks a gray-haired man. <laughs> Becca was also very instrumental in uh, the award that APSIA uh, provided to me, the Innovative Leadership Award that I received uh, last November. I want to thank the organization for that. I have a, a brief story to tell about it. Um, many of you probably know Carol Ong. Carol Ong is the head of our uh, selections uh, division. She came to us from uh, the State Personnel Board when we when DPA and, and the SPB consolidated. She's a lovely, wonderful person with a very kind of dry sense of humor and very quiet. And um, when word came to me that I had actually been awarded the Innovative Leadership Award from APSIA, Carol was in my office. We were having a, I have a weekly meeting with her in which I was reviewing some of the problems in her area. And uh, someone came in and said, uh, you know, we heard that you've just been awarded this Innovative Leadership Award from APSIA. And um, Carol, in her um, wonderful, uh, dry, humoristic way, looked at me and without me uh, losing a beat, she said, I didn't know you were Asian. <laughs> I love that story. Um, I want to uh, thank APSIA. Uh, it's a top-notch organization. Uh, I interact with uh, representatives of state employees all over state government. I interact with all of the unions that represent state employees, the supervisory organizations that represent supervisors and managers, the retiree organizations that represent retirees, um, the um, organizations that represent various uh, disabled and ethnic groups in state government. There is uh, no more professional uh, excellent organization than APSIA. They, they have just uh, impressed me to the greatest extent. The uh, conference that they put on in November, uh, last November, was just top-notch and everybody walked away from that thinking they had learned a great deal and that they had a chance to network with other friends and advance uh, their knowledge about uh, leadership and other topics that were discussed there. Uh, the facilitating of this particular program, not just my uh, discussion tonight, but all of the other speakers that you'll hear throughout the year about leadership is just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for people to get together and talk about uh, uh, things that are important and things that matter to them. Uh, I don't know how you guys finance your organization, uh, but every dollar that is, is uh, contributed to this organization is extremely well spent and very, very well productive. And I, I want to say thank you to APSIA for not just hosting these events, but for being around uh, in a much broader sense and providing 
uh, opportunity, support, education, and, um, and uh, a community uh, of state employees here. It's an excellent, excellent thing. Uh, love to see it replicated all in, in other areas. I also want to make one other acknowledgement if I can. Uh, these are my colleagues, Gina Foreman, who is a head of my um, uh, exam unit in, uh, at Cal <coughs> It's not mine in particular. I don't really own it. Um, <laughs> uh, although when things go wrong, somehow I can <laughs> <laughs> It's yours, yeah. You are. <laughs> Gina's doing a wonderful job for us. And then um, um, my, my treasure. Um, all of you know Jody Travisero, or many of you know Jody Travisero, who is the head of a statewide training program. Um, Jody, uh, let me say this, is probably the most positive person I've ever met in my entire life. The truth of the matter is, our training program has been chronically understaffed. And it's an issue. I'll, I'm going to admit it, it's on tape. <laughs> yeah. We can remove that if you like. <laughs> it's part of the ongoing evolution and process of building CalHR, staffing up in a, in a reasonable and adequate way our training program. And we're just not there yet. We're still working on it. Um, nevertheless, Jody, single, almost single-handedly, she's a little help, but almost single-handedly, has built an extraordinary, uh, robust training program that uh, reaches out and touches uh, state employees from one uh, uh, side of the state to the other. And uh, the quality of the program and the educational materials that uh, we have, uh, the uh, extent of uh, participation of uh, everyone that uh, comes and does webinars from the top executives and state employment to all the experts, the program experts that come, to the, um, all the innovative ideas that have come up with presentations and other forums that we've talked about, uh, various trainings and leadership. It's all um, uh, Jody's doing. Uh, one of the, probably the first lesson of leadership I, I want to tell you is uh, um, uh, when you're in a high-level position, you tend to take credit for things that you don't really do. And I've gotten a fair amount of credit for uh, the training program and the innovations that have been uh, uh, we've rolled out in our training program at CalHR. And the fact of the matter is that uh, the responsibility and the um, the real credit should go to Joe. I really, truly appreciate the work she's done. Thank you. So, let, let's talk about leadership. Um, let me turn to my notes. Hold on just a second. Um, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'm going to uh, start with a commercial. Um, and this is a kind of a lead on from the comments that I just made about Jody. Um, we have uh, all sorts of resources uh, to talk uh, and teach people about uh, leadership. Uh, this is typically something that I might say at the end of the discussion, but I think it's important to kind of lead off with some of the things that are out there that are available to you. Um, that help you kind of uh, analyze and learn about leadership perspectives. So uh, if you go up to the CalHR website, uh, you'll find uh, various resources that are available to you. Leadership guides, uh, interview guides. These are guides that might help you as you interview for advancement or promotion. Um, might give you some perspective on things that you might do or say that enhance your uh, chances of being selected for leadership positions. We have a virtual help desk for supervisors. We have the executive leadership speaker series. This is something that we just uh, put up uh, within the last couple of weeks here. This is an idea that we stole from the New York Times. If you go to the New York Times, there's a section 
called the Corner Office, in which the New York Times has kind of interviewed the titans of industry about what makes them and their organization successful. And the uh, interviews are reprinted, and you very interesting reading from very successful business people all over the country who are talking about some of their leadership ideas, some of the things that make their organization uh, so competitive and so innovative. And so what we thought we would do is we'd bring that idea to state government. We've uh, started the process of interviewing some of the uh, leaders in state government. Uh, Selvi Stanislaw, who you guys know as the director of uh, FTV, John Chung, uh, the controller, and Diana Dooley, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. We're going to put uh, Secretary Morgenstern's interview up shortly, and we're going to uh, continue the process of bringing kind of the thoughts and perspectives of kind of the state uh, leadership uh, to you by uh, interviewing them and posting them on our website. So we have a great deal of resources already available to you uh, at uh, CalHR uh, where you can kind of log on and uh, look for uh, information about improving your leadership skills. I should also mention that we have, as part of CalHR, uh, built a whole new uh, training center. It's on 16th Street, is between R and, and S, and a uh, wonderful classroom facility. We have all sorts of uh, uh, in-person classroom uh, instruction that's given, including instruction in uh, leadership skills. And uh, I invite you to take a look at our catalog online and to sign up uh, for leadership opportunity, uh, educational opportunities as they become available. Uh, so, um, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so enough about the commercial. Uh, let me ask a few things about leadership here. I'm going to take a little poll. Um, how many, let's show of hands now, please. How many can say that you're able to describe the competencies of leaders who are considered high performers in your organization? When we say competencies, we mean the skills that contribute to uh, their success as leaders. How many can say that they can do that, actually? They know leaders, they can, they've identified the things that those people do and are able to describe what makes them successful. Okay, all right, most of you identified leaders in your organization, you're able to kind of um, uh, actually look at what they do and be able to kind of uh, articulate what makes them so successful. Um, what about looking at yourself? Are you aware of your own leadership strengths? Let's start with strengths. How many are, think that they're self-aware enough to know about their own leadership strengths? What about weaknesses now? Uh, okay, people are, think they're pretty self-aware in this room. Okay. <laughs> We're going to find out. <laughs> This is a test. <laughs> How many people uh, uh, demonstrate and effectively apply leadership skills or competencies and behaviors in, in workplace situations? Um, how many think that they actually do that? Okay. Sometimes. Uh, sometimes, okay. Sometimes you're good at leadership. Sometimes not so good at leadership. Depends upon the circumstances. Okay. All right. Well, that's all. That's pretty. knowing those weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> it's knowing the weaknesses. And we're going to talk a little bit about the weaknesses as we go along here. Um, why are they? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's not a poll. Who can retire now? <laughs> it's not a poll question. I see Jeff in the back. <laughs> How many are ready to retire after the first 15 minutes? <laughs> I want to talk about really why leadership is important, uh, a discussion topic. Uh, I'm going to posit to you that we have a leadership crisis in state government, and a leadership crisis in this country, but it really is uh, one of the places that I see it manifesting itself is in state government. And the real question is, why is it that we're experiencing leadership problems? Why is it that we have a leadership crisis? 
And so um, the first thing that we know is that 62% uh, or almost two-thirds of everybody that's in a CEA appointment is of the age that they can retire. So we have a very, very aging uh, executive uh, level of government. Many people who are uh, ready to retire and are retiring in uh, large droves. 50% of all supervisors and managers in state government are ready to retire, are of the age that they can retire. These are the uh, leaders of, of government who have one foot already out the door. Um, CalPERS has 1,200 retirements that they process every single month. So 1,200 leaders in, um, uh, in public employment are uh, leaving on a monthly basis um, in droves, really. These are numbers that are very much higher than what we saw five or 10 years ago. Um, there's not enough Gen Xers to replace the baby boomers. The baby boomers are aging out. The Gen Xers have yet to really reach their maturity and come in and be ready to kind of take up the man. As uh, John Kennedy said, um, the, the torch has been passed. Well, the torch hasn't yet been passed in state government. We are still bringing younger people in who are ready to kind of assume the responsibility of leaders. Leaders are needed in all levels of state government. I think you know that. I think you're experiencing that in your own organizations. You see the leadership ranks thinning out and um, people retiring. Uh, the incentives to stay and work becoming fewer and fewer and uh, we're not replacing leaders at a sufficient pace. Um, beyond that, it's uh, a tough thing these days to be a state employee, a public employee. Um, I'm going to just give you some statistics here that are kind of statewide, that are nationwide. The perception of public employees out there is not good. And so people are disinclined to step forward in public employment and take leadership responsibility. There is a presumption that is uh, kind of manifested in the press, reinforced in the press, reinforced in people's minds, that public employees have it good and that um, uh, they aren't the, um, uh, they, they, they aren't as deserving as, as perhaps you and I might think they, they really are. The president's approval rating right now, 48%, half of the people in the country think he's probably not doing a very good job. Uh, two years ago, it was 31%, so he's uh, seen a remarkable increase in popularity, but he's still below 50%. 15% of America thinks Congress is doing a good job. 85% of America thinks it's not. Uh, here at home, the governor fares much better than the, uh, than the president. Uh, the governor's approval rating is 57%. I think this governor is a very, very popular governor, and I think people think he's doing a wonderful job. Still, the approval ratings are only 57%. Uh, in comparison to the uh, California legislature, approval rating is 29%. That is up from two years ago of 21%. So it's a tough crowd out there. I mean, being a public employee these days is a very difficult thing. And to assume leadership and responsibility in state government is to take on um, the burden of not only directing the work that needs to be done, but accepting the criticism, oftentimes unfair that people have of government and its seeming uh, inability to serve the needs of all. And so it's a very, very difficult thing to assume the mantle of, um, of leadership these days, <coughs> to convince people that there's a good reason to be a good leader. I also think that people have 
lack confidence in leaders because there's no common understanding of what a good leader is. There are all sorts of definitions of leadership qualities, all sorts of ideas about what a good leader is. And you know this. You can talk to your family, your friends, about public figures. And there's a wide disparity of opinions as to whether a particular public figure is a good leader or not. And then when you kind of delve down into that conversation, when you kind of drill down into it, you get very different ideas of what it is to be a good leader. So let's talk about why there's confusion about what a good leader is. Um, first, next slide. Oh, that's not the slide I'm looking for. Okay, let me talk. Um, so first, there is uh, a difference of opinion about personal characteristics that make a good leader. Uh, how many think that a good leader has to be uh, charismatic, bold, and decisive? Let's see a show of hands. You can't choose okay. between the two. You just yeah. <laughs> Okay, many, many, several people think a good leader has to be charismatic, uh, bold, and decisive. How many here think that a good leader should be uh, circumspect, uh, cautious, and calm? How many, how many think? Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a difference of opinion about that. Okay. So what about the scope of responsibilities of a leader? Um, how many think that a good leader is someone that is involved in most, if not all, serious decisions and takes responsibility ultimately for becoming informed and making, uh, ultimately the buck stops here, making serious decisions. Okay, a lot of people think that. How many think that a good leader is someone who can delegate? Who can, okay, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> who can let go of important decisions and pass them out and let people uh, make decisions themselves who are qualified and uh, know uh, the, the nuts and bolts of serious uh, programs. And a good leader can let go and let other people make decisions, right? right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, how many people, let's talk about um, how you motivate people. How many here think that a good leader is someone who should identify qualities of workers that really get them motivated. And not only rewarding, identifying things that will reward employees, but things that uh, aren't so positive, things that will motivate employees to work harder, uh, that are things like uh, things that are self-interested. Things that, maybe even, how many think a good leader is someone who can identify the fears that employees have and motivate them to work hard or something bad might happen to them? How many think a good work, a good leader is somebody who identifies uh, and plays upon, frankly, I don't want to use that in a negative sense, but utilizes uh, kind of the both incentives and the uh, uh, and the uh, fears of employees to motivate them to produce more work. How many think that a good leader does that? Okay, a few. So well, a few people do that. Okay. How many people think that a good leader is someone that uh, offers no reward, no incentive? no punishment, but simply explains to people and motivates people uh, by explaining that they're contributing to the larger good, the greater good of society, that there is something out there that they are doing which makes the world a more positive place. How many think a good leader is, is capable of doing that, of motivating people based on things that are not within their own self-interest? A fair number of us. 
you down. Well, here's my opinion. All of those things, the personal characteristics, being bold, charismatic, and decisive, being calm, cautious, and circumspect, all of those things which may be divergent on their face, divergent characteristics are all things that go into making up a, new, a, a good leader. The scope of responsibility. Being able to take responsibility for becoming informed and making tough decisions, as well as being able to know when to delegate and to let go. Both of those things which are divergent in terms of their, uh, their characteristics, both of those things are necessary for good leadership. Being able to drive the work, even if you have to uh, press people to do work under penalty of uh, discipline or discharge. Being able to, to really get, crack the whip for lack of better description is a necessary quality for good leadership as well as taking a more beneficent perspective. That you may not get anything for yourself, you may not uh, suffer any consequence if you do, don't do the work, but there's a greater good here that we're all working towards accomplishing. Being able to explain that, to articulate that, and to convince people of that. That there's no reward, there's no punishment, but there is a greater good. Being able to drive people on, under penalty or reward, and being able to convince people to work when there is no penalty of reward, those are both good characteristics, or ne necessary characteristics, of good leadership. The point here is that good leaders are multifaceted. They're flexible. They must um, utilize a whole variety, a whole array, a whole panoply of skills, sometimes divergent skills. And they have to be nimble enough to really understand when those skills should be applied and uh, understand the circumstances. All the circumstances that we're all confronted with are different. And you have to take time to really analyze the circumstance you're in and develop the methodology that is best suited to uh, leadership in that particular circumstance. Here's how I began to think about leadership. And here's kind of this, the personal story that I'm going to relay to you, which got me really to focus on what makes a good leader. I think Becca said, in my introduction, I think she informed you that I am an attorney. And I've spent most of my career practicing law. Uh, the job that I have now as the chief deputy director is an administrative executive job, and it's somewhat unfamiliar to me. I, uh, I've been a lawyer more than I've been an executive or an administrator. I started my career briefly with the state of California, and that led me to go to work for 15 years. This wasn't mentioned, probably for good reason. Um, I worked for 15 years for the California State Employees Association. We now know it more familiarly, uh, in a more familiar term, as SEIU 1000. This is the organization that represents about 90,000, currently today represents about 90,000 active state employees. Uh, both rank and file supervisors and managers, as well as a whole group of retirees. Uh, I spent the first maybe seven years of that 15 years representing individual state employees. Uh, and I did so in the context mostly of representing them when they've been disciplined or discharged. Uh, how many uh, know the percentage of state employees that are disciplined or discharged? Uh, every year? 10%? 5%? 5% About 1%. About 1% of the workforce is disciplined or discharged every year. Uh, what does that tell you? <laughs> that tells you that you have to be an extraordinarily poor performer. <laughs> I mean, maybe the stereotype, maybe there's some, you know, maybe there is some, some truth to the stereotype 
about public employees, that they, uh, they never get disciplined or discharged. Um, you have to be an extraordinarily poor performer, or you have to be extraordinarily obnoxious um, to be disciplined or discharged. Uh, this was my clientele for many years. Um, you, I think, know the process, many of you know the process, for appealing a, dis, a dismissal or discharge in state government. You can file an appeal with the state personnel board, the State Personnel Board has a group of administrative law judges that hold a hearing. It's like a court hearing. There's witnesses and the people are sworn in. And there's a judge and the judge makes ultimately a, a written decision at the end of the hearing. The hearing could be an hour, it could be days, it could go on forever. Um, and uh, that decision goes to the State Personnel Board as a proposed decision. The State Personnel Board then meets uh, on a monthly basis and typically adopts the proposed decision that the ALJ writes. When I was doing this work, which was typically about somewhere between about 1985 and 1990, um, there were a couple of administrative law judges that worked for the State Personnel Board that were generally viewed as uh, favorable judges to the state. And so it was very, very difficult um, to bring a case uh, or defend an employee that had been disciplined <clears throat> or discharged. I probably took my caseload at the time was maybe, well, I probably did maybe four hearings a month. So I probably did about 50 hearings a year. Uh, I had more cases than that. Many settled. Some of them were abandoned by the appellants. but. I probably had about, I went to about 50 hearings a year. Um, I never kept close statistics, but I know in the first few years of uh, doing this work, uh, I, was, um, I was losing most every case. Out of 50 cases, probably the dis discipline was upheld in 45 or more. My, uh, the ratio of, of cases that I got overturned uh, by the state personnel board, disciplinary matters that got overturned, was probably about somewhere between 1 and 5 percent. 95 percent or more of the cases that I took to hearing. I, uh, the discipline was sustained. I lost the case. What was I doing? Well, for the first few years, I was trying to prove that my client, the state employee that had been disciplined or discharged, was actually doing good work. So a typical example was uh, an auditor. Is there any auditors here? Right. You, 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 you. I'm a lawyer and I admit it. Okay. <laughs> Former auditor. Okay. Yeah. Grew up as an auditor. All right. So, Auditors. <laughs> Auditors, if you're here, raise your hand. Yeah. Hey. Former. Uh, former. <laughs> so, an auditor for FTV or BOE or some other place might have a caseload of, uh, let's just say hypothetically, 50 cases. 50 uh, members of the public that they were typically businesses that they were out there auditing side of audit. And my typical case was uh, an auditor that had been disciplined or discharged for failing to do a uh, sufficient amount of work. And I'd get this discipline and discharge and I'd sit down with the auditor and I'd review what it is that the, dis the dismissal notice said. And it would say something like this, that the auditor had 50 cases that they had completed two audits that they were working on five more audits and that they haven't touched 45 of the cases that have been assigned to them. Well, I take the case to hearing and I try to prove that the work done on those two audits was exceptional. <laughs> and that uh, the work being done on the five that were in progress was also exceptional. Do you understand now why I lost all my cases? 
it was virtually impossible to overturn a disciplinary action by trying to prove that my client, the work that my client was doing, was good work. Because really, I, I was missing the point. The person was disciplined for all the work that they weren't doing, not for the quality of the work that they were doing, a little bit of, of work that they were doing. Well, if you know me, you know that I hate to lose. I really do. I, I hate to lose. People don't pay me as a lawyer. Uh, the CSCA didn't pay me as a lawyer to lose cases. And uh, it was extraordinarily frustrating to take case after case and try to prove that my client was really a good person, really trying hard, really trying to do a good job, and lose case after case. And after a, a, a few years of this, I really sat down and I kind of thought to myself, what am I doing wrong? And here's the conclusion I came up with. I was really trying to do the wrong thing. Instead of trying to portray my client as a good employee, the real objective was to prove that the supervisor, the manager, the leader in the workplace was doing a poor job. And so the focus became not on my client when I took a case to hear him. The focus became on the supervisor or manager or leader in the workplace. And my job was to prove that that leader in the workplace was doing a poor job of leadership. That was the first time in my career that I really sat down and thought about what makes a good leader. Let's take the auditor case. In the auditor case, instead of proving that my client was doing a great job on two cases and uh, was doing a great job on five others that were in progress, I was now going to prove that the supervisor or manager of my uh, and my client was incompetent, was giving poor instruction, poor training, poor support. I was going to prove that the manager or supervisor was completely inconsistent, was not uh, applying the same standard to my client as they applied to everybody, all the other auditors in the office. So I was now proving that not my client was doing a good job, but my client wasn't doing anything different than anybody else. I was going to prove that the supervisor or manager lacked compassion and understanding. So if my client had some personal problem that perhaps somebody should have been sympathetic to or accommodating of, that that didn't happen. And the result of that was that my client was being victim. That's when I first started to think about what the qualities of leadership are, both positive and negative. What makes you fail as a leader? And that's when I really began to focus on what it is that you're going to do. What's the lesson for you if you're a super? How many people are supervisors and managers? Most everybody here. How many are in executive level? Many, several people. If you are a supervisor, a manager, an executive, a leader in state government, know this, that sooner or later someone will question what it is that you're doing. Someone will challenge what it is that you're doing. Someone will try to expose the work that you're doing as inadequate. And that, I suggest to you, is the best reason for thinking about what makes a good leader. Right. Not out of, you know, daydreaming about what, my, what people might like, but what it is that you can do to ensure that you are going to be successful, that your inadequacies, let's put it that way, won't be exposed. All right. <coughs> So let me also say that my success rate went up. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll give you another example of a case that I had um, which might drive home the point. Uh, I, uh, I had a case that was down in the Central Valley. I won't be too specific about it. Um, a woman, I think she worked for a large department, and she had a job that was very routine. There was a number of um, cases that she had to process, or applications, I believe, that she had to process within a given period of time. And she was far below that standard over a long period of time. And she was finally dismissed for uh, poor performance. I went down and interviewed her. She was a nice, uh, relatively young person, probably about 30. She told me that she was struggling, she had a couple of kids, she needed a job. She wanted uh, her job back, not because she really liked it, but because she had to have the money. She had to support her family. Um, I asked her a series of questions about her circumstances, and I learned that um, she was a widow. Her husband was a um, peace officer in the uh, city that uh, she lived in and was killed in the line of duty. And that she uh, was struggling with, uh, with life. Uh, she was trying to get over the loss of her husband. And um, there was very little recognition of her circumstances and very little accommodation of her circumstances by her supervisors and managers. She needed help. She needed time off. She needed some flexibility. We can all appreciate that under those circumstances. I didn't try to prove that she was doing a great job. I didn't even <coughs> attempt to do that. What I tried to do was prove that her supervisors lacked compassion, lacked caring, weren't listening, got her job back. It's an example of how um, we have to really pay attention. Um, okay, so Jody, bring me to the next slide. Howard? Yes. Did you succeed? Oh, I did succeed in getting her job back. Yes, I did. Um, We have a lot of different ways of diagramming the qualities of leadership that, uh, and competencies, the skills that are necessary for becoming a good leader. This is a, um, a competency model that we've developed for the state of California. Jody, you want to help me with this? You want to comment a little bit about this particular model and where it was developed and, and how it can be used. Can you, can you help me with that a little Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. The, yeah. the competency model was based on a survey of 16,000 leaders. Uh, the, the competency model consists of 16 uh, soft skills for 985 state classifications. When you take a state supervisory related exam, you'll find that these competencies are on the exam. Uh, they apply to all leaders in California. Uh, there are an additional seven for the executive level. Um, positions in state government, and um, all I can say is there's soft skills for leaders that were uh, that apply to all leaders in California that were developed uh, using a, a standardized method of uh, job analysis, and they're used on all the exams. Can you, you find this information on uh, our website? Where, where do you find it on our website? The Leadership Competency Model is the foundation uh, for many tools on our website, anything from exams. If you just go into the search uh, feature of our website and type in competency model or leadership competency model, or possibly leadership, you should find it. Uh, but you'll also find anything from leadership development guides, there's a video powered actually on it, where you have training, uh, all training, free training associated with each of these soft skills. So. so the point is kind of a couple of points here. There are complex ways of diagramming all of the interplay between kind of the goals of leadership and the various uh, factors that go into accomplishing this, these goals. Um, I'm not going to detail 
what all of these various uh, goals and, and factors are. I'd like you, if you can, at your leisure, to go and look at this information and study it yourself. The point is that there is a whole interplay of skills, goals, and circumstances which, de which uh, determine the, the leadership style which is most successful. Um, and um, we are also ultimately trying to match up these skills with the environment in which you work. You want to give me the next slide? There are, I think you have to align your strengths, your passions with the organization and circumstance that, that you actually work in. And those organizations, those circumstances can be very different. You want to show me uh, the next slide? We have audit cultures. These are organizations that are very um, uh, dedicated to um, very defined rules, very strict procedures, very um, uh, result-oriented organizations. And they're driven by uh, getting uh, a specific job done in a specific way. We have political cultures, organizations that are very reactive to political circumstances that uh, they are dealing with. We have organizations that are technical, that provide technical expertise. <coughs> Their whole uh, uh, orientation is to go out and provide technical expertise to various uh, end users, whether they be state departments or members of the public. And then we have customer service cultures, organizations whose entire focus is on providing service to the public. All of these places all have different cultures, different objectives, different uh, ways of getting work done. And the supervisory and managerial skills that work in this culture may not work in, in this culture or this culture or this culture. And so you really have to identify the goals and uh, environment in which you're working and align uh, your skills with the objectives of the organization in which you're working. Okay. All right. Okay. The question that you can have a combination like the audit and culture and customer service. Is it just pretty much one singular? No, that's an excellent question. In fact, there are gradations and variations and blending of all of those cultures. So you can find an audit organization that's very customer service oriented. You can find a <coughs> political organization that provides technical advice. So you really have to identify the culture and objective of your organization. Um, all right. I'm going to try to bring what has up to this point been a somewhat abstract conversation about leadership to a more practical point. Uh, we've <coughs> talked about qualities of leadership. We've talked about trying to find what a good leader is we've talked about aligning skills with cultures and environment in which you work in. All of that, I think, is a very abstract. Trans, what, how is that going to help you when you walk out of here, become a better leader? It may get you thinking about, like this conversation up to this point, may get you thinking about leadership. But I don't think I've really offered you anything yet that's going to make you a better leader. That's going to get you to be a better leader. Let me try to do that. There are some very simple leadership skills that span the entire penelope of, uh, of cultures and uh, environments that all leaders, that are accessible to all leaders, and that can be employed to improve your leadership skills. Let me talk about those. Uh, some of you have heard this before. There's what I call the 10, 20, and 30 formula. Um, now I'm going to take a show of hands after I explain this to you. All right, so I think, here's what I'm going to tell you that you're going to walk away with. Now start listening. Um, this is, 
this will help you become a better leader. Okay, 10, 20, 30 formula. These are things that I want you to do. Ask 10 questions before making a decision or giving advice in any circumstance. When people come to you, they come to you as a, with a difficult problem. They don't come to you with easy problems. That's not why people show up on your doorstep. They come to you with a problem that is so complex that they need help figuring it out. Or it's so sensitive, either politically or otherwise, that they really don't feel comfortable making the decision themselves. It's a scary problem. It's a scary thing. People show up on your doorstep as a leader when they can't fix whatever the problem is that's in front of them. And they want your help. When they do that, before you dispense advice, before you give direction, ask 10 questions. Now, I say ask 10 questions even if you think from the moment they walk into your office that you know ultimately what it is that needs to be done in order to deal with the problem. Even if you think you know that before the conversation even starts. Ask 10 questions. Invariably, the advice that you ultimately dispense, the direction that you ultimately give, will be modified by the answers you get to those 10 questions. Let me, uh, and these are the who, what, when, why, how questions about any given problem. Let me give you the best example you want to Give me the, yeah, here we are, family night at the movies. Best example to, to illustrate this. How many here have children? How many here have teenage children or have uh, those that have gone through the teenage years? <laughs> and you're going to really understand this then. How many have had a teenager come to them and say to you, I want to go out to the movies with my friends. Okay? Most everybody. You're the leader. You're the parent. You are the leader figure in the household. Who here would say yes or no to that request without answer, asking 10 questions? <laughs> Nobody would do that. Of course you wouldn't do that. You want to know who they're going with. When are they going to be home? What is it that they're going to see? Is there somebody that you know that's going with them? How is the transportation going to be done? Um, what's the movie rated? You know, on and on. I, I can, you've asked all these questions of your kids when they've, they've come to you. I can tell you that the advice that you give, or the direction that you give at the end of those 10 questions will be modified by the answers that you get. Uh, it's a very simple, maybe too simple example of how asking 10 questions will ultimately lead you to make better decisions uh, and give better direction. It will also allow the person that is coming to you the opportunity to explain their perspective and participate in the decision-making process. Who here can't ask, who's unable to ask 10 questions when people come to them with problems? Raise your hand if you're unable to do that. Everybody here can do it, of course. Very simple. Everybody can ask 10 questions. Now, I'm being a little literal. Sometimes you're going to ask 15 questions. Sometimes you're going to ask eight questions or five questions. Ask questions before giving advice, before dispensing direction. Ask 10 questions, the 20. You have to listen for 20 minutes a day if you're going to be a good leader. 
It doesn't have to be 20 consecutive minutes a day, but it has to be 20 minutes a day. It can be, those 20 minutes can be spread over the course of several conversations. But you have to shut up if you want to be a good leader. And I mean really shut up. When people come into your office and are explaining a problem, shut up and listen. Um, very often, very often, you will not hear anything new, anything that you don't already know. Sometimes you will hear something new, something that you don't know, and when you hear that, invariably it will influence your decision. Beyond that, even if you don't hear something, you will establish a relationship which you will validate the person that comes in and explains to you what the problem is. You will establish a, a relationship which is co-equal and you will give respect to the person <coughs> who brings you the problem. Who here in this room, raise your hands, cannot shut up and listen for 20 minutes a day? Raise your hand if you can. <laughs> Nobody. Everybody in this room can do that. Okay? So what city? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about me, Bill. <laughs> everybody can do this. It's accessible to everybody. All right. Okay. The 30. You must read for 30 minutes a day. You must read for 30 minutes a day. Sometimes you want to read for more than that, but at least every day you must sit down and read. Can you show me some of the things that I... I think newspapers are a must. If you're a leader in state government, it's important to read newspapers. I read typically three newspapers a day. I read the New York Times, I read the Los Angeles Times, and I read the Sacramento Bee. I don't read them cover to cover, but I read the front page stories in all of those newspapers every single day. Um, and oftentimes, very often, in fact most often, I'm reading about stories that are unrelated to the work I'm doing. They're having, they have something to do with business, typically. They have something to do with uh, current events in some other part of the country. They have really nothing to do with the state. But I'm reading those newspapers. I also think you need to read other materials. Novels are important to read. Uh, websites, blogs, uh, journals, technical manuals, uh, magazines. Uh, you all have magazines that you subscribe to. It doesn't really matter as long as you read them. Don't have them come to your house and put them on the uh, nightstand and never look at them. Okay. I read uh, the New Yorker. Is there a pattern here about New York? I read the New Yorker. <laughs> um, but there are, t you know, time, everything from Time Magazine to National Geographic to uh, Esquire to whatever. Sports Illustrated doesn't matter. You must sit down and read. And here's why I'm making this point so emphatically. In order to be a good leader, you have to have a worldly view, a broad view of the world around you, the environment that you live in. And the only way, you, because you can't personally experience the entire world that's around you, the way you learn about it is to read. The way you know about the world that's around you is to sit down and read about it. You cannot personally experience everything in the world that goes on around you. And in order to make wise decisions, you have to understand the world that you live in. Who here, raise your hand, cannot read for 30 minutes a day? Let me just find out for just for kicks here. Who, who, who here does? When you think about how much you read, not 
memos that are given to you necessarily by your co-workers, but sits down and reads material that's unrelated to your work for 30 minutes a day. Most everybody good. I'm glad to see you. So this is one of the habits that you've already got, and I think you already understand the value of Okay. Ask 10 questions, listen for 20 minutes, read for 30 minutes a day, 10, 20, 30. Would watching the news be the same? I'm sorry? Would watching the news be the same or not? No, it's not the same. Um, <coughs> you don't absorb information in the same way. And the news t that is broadcast is typically uh, watered down in a way that isn't nearly as um, educational as um, reading. Now, if you're watching PBS, I might make an exception. <laughs> but typically, uh, the 6 o'clock news on a network channel isn't like sitting down and reading a newspaper. You're just not going to get the same information. Um, all of this is designed for one purpose. Uh, asking 10 questions, uh, listening for 20 minutes, reading for 30 minutes. It's designed, all of these practices are designed to inform you, to make you more informed. And this is the point that I want to make. And I've taken an hour to do it, I think. If you want to be a good leader, make informed decisions. If you make good informed decisions, people, no matter what environment, no matter what circumstance, people will follow you. People will do what you ask them to do. People will trust you to lead. Make informed decisions. If there's one quality of leadership that I think is probably higher and more important, more central than any of the other qualities that we've talked about in the abstract, it's being informed. Making good informed decisions in any circumstance, in any context. All leaders in every situation must become informed. If you make good informed decisions, people will follow. That's my message for tonight. I want you to take away the 10. I want you to forget about all the abstraction stuff. That I've done. <laughs> I want you to take away the 10, 20, 30 formula. I want you to practice it. I want you to think about it when you go to work tomorrow. And I want you to give it a try. If you don't already do this, give it a try. Think about listening for 20 minutes. And I mean, again, listening, not conversing, listening. Uh, think about reading for 30 minutes, thinking of, think about asking questions, 10 questions or, or thereabouts when people come into your office. I guarantee you, you'll be a, le a better leader if you do that on a consistent basis. Happy to answer questions, have a dialogue, converse with you about leadership. Any questions, any thoughts, anything you want to know about, any comments, any contributions? Let's give another thank you and round of applause for Howard. Remember everyone. Please heed his advice in taking action with the practice skills that you have learned tonight. We're going to be asking everyone the outcomes they received when you return August 6th for Commissioner Farrell. Questions and answers for this evening will follow on the Part 2 video. Thank you for attending and remember each and every day it's your choice to be the change you choose to see in the world. So stand up and be heard.